everyone. Thank you for downloading Garden Fork Radio. You're here with Rick and Will. Welcome, Will. Eric and Will. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think there's like some kind of rule that Rick and I can't talk to each other or something. So. Oh, we could have you all on, or you guys could do your own show, and I'll just I'll just put it on. That's free content for me. All right, Rick, give me a call. Have your people call my people. We'll do lunch. Rick and I are going to be talking more about uh, tomatoes. We got some, uh, oh, is his, is his name? He's from Westfield, Texas, and he listens to the show, and I'm blanking on your name right now. Um, but about the Garden Gem tomatoes, that's coming up. But for all you new people that have just discovered Garden Fork Radio, it's an eclectic, casual conversation about cooking and gardening and DIY and Eric's efforts to motivate people to use more of their brain and go out and do things in their community and it's a big conglomerate of eric and his friends and will is great because you basically emailed me and said uh let's do a show and i'm like oh okay you know <laughs> so we were going to talk about some of the improvements to your country house and then you had some gardening questions what do you want to start with well, let's start with the gardening question. We were sitting down talking and, you know, we grow pumpkins, we have garlic, we have um, asparagus, the apple orchard, that kind of stuff. And she said, hey, is it too late to plant a garden? And I'm like, I don't know what we could plant this late in summer that would still work because I don't think tomatoes would work. And she's like, well, who do you know that you could ask? And I'm like, I know the guy. I'll talk to him this Friday. <laughs> Let me see what he has to say. So the question to you, Eric, and a lot of people is, what do you plant in midsummer or fall that you can still harvest before winter? Sugar snap peas and salad greens and uh, beets. And you could probably even get some kale going. Now, is it something you have to do them in a, in a what is it, a window box or a, no. a hoop house or any of that? So if you just put them in the ground and let them go, you don't have to worry about the cold at all. Yeah, the only issue you run into uh, if what's like you want to starting salad greens is the bed has to very has very fine soil. You can lay down the salad green seeds. And I get like a mesclun mix from Fedco Seeds. They're really great. They're um, this co seed cooperative up in Maine. And then you want to put fine, a very fine covering of soil over that and water them in. And if there's too much heat, some of them may not germinate or they might bolt right away. But um, it's definitely something that you can do. And sugar snap peas, you can sow them... I think up to 60 days before your frost date. Another, they're cool weather crops. The salad greens are cool weather. Uh, sugar snap peas are cool weather as well. And kale, kale can grow into the winter. So you, you can just start it now. You could start like mustard, mustard greens as well right now. And they're a little heat sensitive. But if you go through the Fedco catalog, it'll describe whether they're heat tolerant or not. And get them going. And then, you know, going into fall, you could like make a, a mini greenhouse. We have a couple of videos about that. Or just use some uh, row cover, that floating Rime row cover stuff to kind of protect them a bit from the elements. But yeah, you could, there's totally time to do it. So no tomatoes, no no uh, uh, cucumbers or anything like that? No, they're they're hot weather. They're Mediterranean crops. So I told you so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you does your air does your garden area get a lot of sun or is it sheltered or no it, it unfortunately it gets a lot of sun like the the rhubarb uh picture that i sent you the other day where it was all kind of turning brown and starting to shrivel up i was thinking that it's getting cooked out there because you know we have an area on the property where we're, we're completely covered with trees all the way over the property but then you get to the area where the orchard is and everything else and it's a big open field area so i thought hey perfect area for gardens and things like that and so it gets sunlight from basically about eight in the morning until about seven at night that's great by the way if you want to see will's property he has a youtube channel called the weekend homestead and uh i taught even some cool drone video footage there and a lot of walkthroughs little vicarious living with uh with will's garden but yeah rhubarb burns out in direct sun in the middle of summer mine burns out um, i have a neighbor whose rhubarb is still growing i think their soil is a lot better than mine i need to dump some cow manure around my rhubarb i wonder is it a, go ahead well, is it is it a moisture thing or is it a the sunlight dries it out i mean because we haven't mulched uh, pretty good so I, I would think that it would hold the moisture pretty good I think it's a heat thing, but uh, someone is talking back to their podcast device right now with an answer for that. So radio at gardenfork.tv. 
Perfect. That'll work just great. Um, but rhubarb dies out. But yeah, I mean, your summer crops, you're just, you're, you know, if you want more, you're going to have to go to the farmer's market. <laughs> yeah, that's what we've been doing. And uh, it's just been some a debate of whether or not we could get it to work. But I think what we're going to try to do is we, we have some plans right now. Um, you know, we have the apple orchard and I have some fencing left over from the apple orchard when we did that and some posts. And I was thinking of making a garden area and then putting some raised beds inside of it and and taking a real run at it next year. Just this year, everything kind of got away from us in the summer with all the other projects. It's hard. I mean, we made a recent video about the garden successes and fails and my uh, salad mescaline bed went to heck. Um, and I, uh, I knocked it all down with my uh, string trimmer but I've yet to follow through and plant something there. <laughs> you know. Did, did you get all the that mulch and the dirt from somebody else and that's why it was full of weeds or why did all of a sudden that dirt become full of weeds but the rest of your garden doesn't? Because though that bed I added the uh, compost soil from a, a neighbor. It was very generous of them, you know, and they didn't know either, but it had been sitting in a pile in their back field and just, you know, the seeds from around just kind of blow and land on the thing. So the soil, gotcha. it's the soil compost is great. It's just that it's, it's chock full of weed seeds, but that can happen, you know, with stuff from a farm or, you know, wherever you get it, unless it's been heated or sterilized or steamed um, to kill the germination of the seed, you, you run that risk, but you know, what the hell? Oops, now, sorry. is there something, <laughs> is there something you can do to, uh, um, kill the seeds. Like I've seen some things online where they take like black plastic and put it over there and then let the sun bake it all year long for next year. That kind of stuff. Does that stuff really work or not? Yeah, I do that. Um, I actually cover my beds. Some of them I cover in the fall with black plastic with the idea that since there's a raised bed in the spring that the whole soil heats up faster, but with black plastic on it, it'll heat up even faster. But I've discovered that the mice love to build nests under the black plastic. <laughs> So what yeah. I've been doing lately is like this spring before the snow belt, I put a piece of black plastic on top of the snow that was on the raised bed and just held it down with rocks. And the black plastic helped melt the snow, which then kind of watered the raised bed. And I didn't have the mouse problem. And it, and it did help raise the temperature of the bed a little bit. So I think I'm doing something. <laughs> yeah, my thought is I have a, a pile of uh, black dirt kind of compost and I was thinking of using that next year for the raised beds, but then I saw your video about the weeds and stuff in there, and I was just thinking, is I'm wondering if I got like a black tarp or something like that, threw it over the top and let it sit there and bake over the summer and the winter that in the springtime when I get to use it, hopefully it would heat up enough that it would kill the seeds in there. It would certainly help. It would certainly help. I mean, it won't, if you spread it thin and do the plastic, it would, it would do most of it, but the seeds that are deep in the pile stay dormant. Um, gotcha. So that's a good Oh, and also radishes. Radishes pop up, you know, like dandelions. So you could also plant dandelion. Go If you go to Fedco Seed, the website is a little clunky, but I think you can download a PDF of their printed catalog. And I really like the descriptions. And they have a number of lettuce salad mixes. One's called a summer mix. One's called a fall winter mix, I think. And they're relatively inexpensive. And that I think is the way to go. Plus, they talk. Uh, they talk a lot. Of, they talk a lot about cold tolerant plants because they're they they grow these seeds in Maine. So, see, that's the thing is, I I like looking at some of those sites like that because I, don't get me wrong, the guys who have the the apple orchard or where you can buy the trees and stuff down in the southern um, areas and things like that. I I think when I talk to them, I get one type of answer, and then when I talk to somebody, let's say from the East Coast or something like that, that I get a better answer to kind of my area because I think when you live through it you kind of know what works and what doesn't right and for those of you that haven't listened before um will um lives in Wisconsin and Minnesota so yep up north uh, up north hey <laughs> we're, we're in the height of the tourist season right now up north so it's uh it's pretty crazy we go from you know uh, we live in the Hayward area and Hayward is a town of you know 2000 people but then in the summer when it rolls around you're at 10 12000 people just milling everywhere the ice cream shop is busy the candy shop the antique stores are packed with people it's it's a lot of fun it's a, it's a nice area our town uh upstate is very small and there's a 
there's a weekender population because I'm one of them. Um, but the towns around us kind of swell up more. But I actually gave a talk at the local historical society um, about smoking salmon in a cardboard box and collecting uh, weeds in your yard to put in your salad. And it was a pretty good turnout. I was kind of surprised at actually how many people and people that I didn't even know from. There were people that were clearly not from the town. I thought, I thought that was kind of interesting. How did uh, I guess how did you get tied up in something like that? Did they contact you or did they, they did you see something there and you went, hey, I want to do that, too? Or no, like, I'm a known, to do that, I'm a known entity in town. <laughs> so. Oh, you're that guy. Oh, hey, hey, there's that Eric guy from the Garden Fork. I run the town email list. I started, I rambled about this my last solo show about, you know, being a community, active in your community, but I started a town email list just by collecting my friends' names and word of mouth. And so whenever any of the town uh, groups has an event, they'll email me the information and I shotgun it out to like 400 email addresses. And so people recognize my name and they, oh, that's Eric, you know, and they see me at the general store. So, um, and they all have a vague idea of what I do for a living. So. <laughs> nice. I, I actually had something similar to that happen to me a couple of weeks ago up in Hayward. We were at the Hayward family restaurant for breakfast and we're standing kind of in the little vestibule up in the front waiting to uh, sit down. And my dad and my mom were there and wife and the kids and everything. And all of a sudden I hear somebody from behind me go, hey, you're that guy. Uh-oh. <laughs> Is that the first time that's happened to you? Yeah. So I turned. I'm like, hi, can I help you? And he's like, yeah, you're the guy from the videos I've been watching. My brother introduced me to your channel and stuff. That's so cool. You're doing stuff up in Hayward and stuff. It's a great area and whatever. Wow. And he's like, oh, there's Cameron and so on. And I'm like, oh, this is a little strange, but it, you know, it, it was nice. So. It's flattering and unsettling at the same time. Yeah, it was like he well, the comment that made it a little unsettling is he goes, I know exactly where your house is. And I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> because um, if you're up in the area and um, driving down one of the county roads and stuff like that, there's not very many houses that had construction at the time. And they actually worked for a construction company and they were trying to figure out who was doing the contracting work. So he owns a contracting company. So that's how he knew where our place was, was because he's like, he knew where all the permits were and all the jobs and stuff like that, because they keep track of that stuff. He's like, Oh, I know exactly which project you guys are. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about that, but okay, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. We live on a very, uh, you have to know the road that we live on. You have to know where you're going to get on the road that we live on. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of people that have said, uh, in interesting things. Usually it's very flattering. It's usually in airports in the Midwest. Uh, is where people know who I am. So that's kind of cool. In New York nice. City, I am I blend in. So, Yeah, I'm would. I I'm guessing unless you're like Casey Neistat in New York City, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. Yeah, everyone's a YouTube or Instagram star here. So, <laughs> Perfect. So I have a, a couple of questions for you. The first one, you, you did a couple of video tours and we were in your basement and you did the epoxy floor. How did that turn out? Actually, it's it's your timing on this is perfect because uh, on the last video when we talked about it a little bit, I said, hey, I'm working on a video to show you how to do this. And I had a little microphone mishap um, when we recorded the video of doing the epoxy, the microphone wasn't connected properly. So you have my head talking and there's no audio at all for about 10 minutes of the video. So. I'm actually going to this weekend epoxy the other half of the basement. So we did the first half, which was the east half of the basement, and it turned out great. You know, you clean the floor. Um, that takes probably the longest is cleaning everything up. And then you do the epoxy itself, and and you put the little uh, flakes down to kind of break up the pattern and, and give it a little traction. But this weekend, I'm actually, now that we've finished the construction kind of on the east half of the basement, I'm going to do the west half of the basement. So my hope is, is that I'll catch the video that I was missing. And then I've had this thing sitting on my computer for three months now, and everybody can kind of see how the project goes together. Yeah, I think that's a dream of a lot of people to epoxy the cement floor for a number of reasons. It'll just, it makes it a lot easier to clean the floor. Um, I think it well, looks better. You, you go to one of the big box stores. I, I mean, I went and they had it on sale. It was thirty nine ninety nine for the kit. And it does basically the equivalent of a single car garage stall. So if you're thinking of space wise, if you have a single car garage, yeah, it'll do that. If you have a dual car garage, it does half of it. So buy two of the kits. So for 
under a hundred dollars, you can get the kit. It comes with everything on the instructions on how to do it. The two chemicals you mix together to kind of make it happen. And the cool thing is, is now the kits come with a generic color and then you get to pick whatever color you want, just like paint. So they have a, just as you would, could pick out a paint swat and go, this is the color I want for my walls. You can go, this is the color I want for my floor. So to do your garage, honestly, if you're listening to this right now, you could probably go to the store, buy a kit or two, and within a weekend, you could have it done. You know, spend the first day cleaning it and making sure it's dry. Then the next day, go out there and epoxy it. And by the next day, you're driving on it and it's good to go. Yay. The biggest thing is the prep, it seems like. And then, um, but the that problem actually, is if you have an older floor, then you really have to pay attention to that because you don't know what kind of material has been dropped on that floor, you know? Well, that's it. I mean, the, the prep work for it probably takes three times as long as the epoxy stuff. Like you're down there scraping things off and doing some grease uh, cleaner. Actually, Dawn dish soap works really good for cleaning the floor. And uh, we uh, just uh, cleaned the floor in, the, in there and, and got everything cleaned up. If it's in your garage, they, give, they have an acid wash kit I think you can get for like 10 or $15 that will kind of clean up the oil stains that are on your floor or stains that are there. They also say that if you have cracks, you can get crack filler and stuff like that. And then the epoxy will actually adhere to that stuff also and uh, make it all nice, smooth. So if you have a big crack or a gouge missing, you know, fill that gouge in and then do the epoxy work. And surprisingly enough, our basement had a lot of gouges in it. I don't know why, but there was just chunks of concrete kind of missing here and there. So I patched them all before we did it. Once you put the epoxy down, it looks like it was always that way. Wow, I wonder what they were dropping on that floor. Maybe they were splitting wood down there. I don't know. Actually, what one of the things I was thinking about is they may have had a wall at one point in time down there. And then you know how you can get those nails that where you put a two by four down and you hammer it through and it goes into the concrete yeah. and it kind of goes in. And then when they pulled that wall out, it seemed like this, the little circles were you know evenly spaced apart, which made me think that there were some kind of bolts or some kind of nails that were nailing yeah. something to the concrete. Yeah, now you can use uh, a tool called a ram set, which has uh, a little 22 powder cartridge, you know, a 22 caliber gun uh, cartridge and drives the nail through really nicely. <laughs> so interesting. We've been using uh, tap cons. I, I don't know if, you, if that's a brand name or a type of screw, but we use those to mount things to the concrete wall in the basement and things like that. And they work pretty good. Yeah. Tapcon is a commercial name, but it's be, kind of become generic, like like Xerox is for photocopy, you know. Sure. Um, I found the trick with tap cons is to not drill too big of a hole or don't let the drill bit round out the hole. Have you well, run now, into that or? Well, here's the thing is like the ones that we bought, if you buy the medium sized box, not the little one that has like five in it, but the medium sized box actually comes with the drill bit in it now. Yes. So I've been using that and because I had the same thing is I was using my own drill bit and first I'd wreck it because you're not supposed to drill into concrete with a wood drill i guess I yeah don't that. do that don't do that learn from me there's there's your line right there learn from me well <laughs> trust me i was like oh yeah we'll just get the drill out and we'll just oh well, that didn't work but uh the 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 screws come with their own drill bit now so um it has the little piece on the end of it so it doesn't get wrecked in the concrete and it, it makes the hole just a little smaller than the screw and then when you put the screw in it turns out perfect every time and tap guns are a double threaded uh cement lag bolt and um I would suggest not getting the kind with the Phillips head, but get the kind with the hex head on it so you can use a socket wrench on it. Because the, the Phillips ones, if they get stuck in a weird way, you round out the Phillips head and it's a problem. Yeah, you strip them out real easily. We, we used it, uh, the Phillips ones for doing small things. Like I had some electrical conduit that we put the straps on to hold it to the wall and that kind of stuff. You know, the metal pipe that you put electrical wire in. Yeah. We had a couple of those run down and it's like, you know, I'm not holding up a shelf that's going to have, you know, my Encyclopedia Britannica on it or something like that. So <laughs> that's more information we need to know about the encyclopedias you're hoarding down Just there. Just saying, it's a, it's a great resource to read. <laughs> I I just love, I don't have a set, but when uh, my family did, I would just pull a book out and start reading stuff. And that's that's how I learned a lot. So Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a, it's, you know, I think kids these days are going to, right, here I go, I'm making it sound like I'm 80 years old, but kids these days uh, aren't going to know the encyclopedia. They're going to know Wikipedia and all that stuff. So whatever. I, you know, I use both. So. But speaking of hammer drills, I have an inexpensive hammer drill that I will link to in the show notes here. It's about 60 bucks, and um, I actually used it on a lot of my contracting jobs, and it worked just fine. 
So a hammer, having a hammer drill allows you to have a regular corded drill with a lot of torque. And then when you need to go into cement, you can flip this little switch on the top and it goes in the hammer drill mode. And it is like butter. It is so much easier than wrestling with your regular little dinky drill or something. It just goes right in. I actually got one of the uh, drill kits from the yellow company that uh, has a setting where it can be a drill, it can be a hammer drill, it can be whatever, and it's cordless, 18 volt or something like that. And that's what I use down in the basement. And I was surprised, like I had never used that before and come to realize that that functionality was there the whole time and I had never used it. So, you know, now we use it on a lot of different things. Yay. So I've asked you this question a couple of times in regard to your um, renovation, but are there some uh, recent takeaways you could share? Some little aha light bulb moments about, oh, I could just do this better or you learned something along the way? I will say... One thing that I did figure out is doing something remote is a little bit more challenging than doing something in a local area. As example, we live in the Twin Cities and our property is two and a half hours from from the Twin Cities. Well, in the Twin Cities, if I need to run to Home Depot because I forgot a part or a bit or a screw or something like that, it's a five minute drive and, you know, I'm off to, you know, any of the big box stores versus um, let's say I have a scenario where I'm up north there's not necessarily a place that I can go to to get that plumbing fitting that I need that's specific for that part. So that project has to stop. So when you're doing a remote project, what I suggest doing is I go to the big box store and like we were doing a drain for the bathroom and I literally sat on the floor, well not sat on the floor, but on the ground in the store, I put all of the pieces together and imagined, okay, this is what I'm connecting into. Here's what I'm going to, here's where I'm going. And then I was trying to think, okay, is that a three quarter or was that a half inch or whatever? And I'd end up buying both the three quarter and the half inch pieces and then going and doing my project and using the parts. And then the stores are usually pretty good about taking the return back if you ended up buying the wrong thing or whatever. But that's one thing I'd say is if you're doing a remote project, planning is key because if you get halfway into, let's say, a plumbing project and then realize you're missing some really key parts to the project that you have to put that project either on hold till the following week when you come back up or you have to take time to drive back to the store And it's that back and forth to the store, multiple trips that actually cause projects to take a lot longer than they normally would. Yeah, I have a very similar experience. I'm I'm still experiencing that during the week now, I think kind of spatially in my head, okay, what do I need to do X and X? And then I will go to the home improvement store here and I always buy more than I think I need. But I'm also respectful of the store and that I don't like if it's in a box, I don't tear the box open and make it unsellable. I try and keep it in pristine condition if I didn't use it. And I and I the stores are pretty good about, you know, taking back returns. But like copper fittings and that um, I always buy more than I need. And a lot of times I keep them because I realize there's going to be another project where I need some half inch, you know, 45 degree elbows and stuff like that. Yep. And I, I would have to say that I agree 100% with that in the sense that I talked to the people at the returns counter one time and I said, hey, how often do you guys get returns and stuff like that? And they said, we get them all the time. And actually, we like people like you. You know, Some people, they'll rip open the box or destroy the plastic container or whatever it is and then bring it back to the store. And then it's kind of a hassle for the store to either have to send it back to the manufacturer and get, you know, credit for it so they can repackage it and it costs a lot of money or, you know, you destroy the box and then they can't resell it or they have to discount it or something like that. But she said, if you take good care of the package when you take it home, or if you get something that doesn't have a package and it's in good condition when you return it with the little UPC still on it and the and all the stickers and everything like that, that uh, they're happy to take that stuff back. And it's not a problem because they just put it right back on the shelf and, you know, it's ready for the next person. But if you destroy it while you have it at your house, one, they can refuse the return potentially, which right. then you lose the benefit of what you were trying to do. And two, it becomes a big hassle. So they're very grateful. They're like, you know, we know they they get to know you as you come in and out of the places more and more often, especially when you're on a big project like we had. And, uh, I was on a first name basis with a lot of the folks in the stores. (laughs) Oh, it's Will. (laughs) Yeah, literally I would call and, and Ryan from the one store would be like, Oh, Hey, Will, how's it going? Okay. What are we working on this week? How did that work out last week? And so on. Do you have any of this or whatever? And we got to the point actually where the delivery drivers would pick up our returns and take them back to the store for us. So if you're really nice to people, they'll be really nice to you. So karma is boomerang. 
Yeah, you know, I had a, a little thing of coffee for the guy every time he came for a delivery and stuff like that, or like when my buddy Todd was there, he would have a coffee ready. They'd come and, you know, talk about the project a little bit because the delivery guy, and he's like, oh, where do you want that? Okay, I'll put that over here. Here, do you want me to open that pallet for you or move this or whatever? And, you know, they were really good about that kind of stuff. So small town stuff, you find that. That's really yeah. nice. So A little off tangent, but when we um, take our Labradors to the vet, we have uh, a vet upstate we really like. We also have a vet in New York. But um, when we go upstate to the vet, I bring a dozen bagels and cream cheese from New York. Oh, yeah. And they love that. (laughs) That is a that's a great idea. They're like, you just put it on the counter and they know what it is because it has that yeasty bagely smell, you know, and they're they're from the city. They're not from like the, the, the bagel chain store next to the dollar store in the strip mall, you know? So, um, yeah, little things like coffee and bagels go a long way. Yeah. I think the other thing we learned more than anything was you can do a lot yourself. Like I, there's a lot of things in this project that I had never done before. Like I've never epoxied a floor or I've, I've never set a sink or, um, you know, done an electrical panel or anything like that. And you do some research and you learn, the biggest thing that I tell people is know what you can do and what you can't do and figure out what you can hire out that might be more worth your time. Example, you and I had a conversation about finishing sheetrock and uh, painting. I could easily paint the place. I could easily uh, sheetrock and hang the sheetrock, but then finishing it, it probably wouldn't turn out to the quality level that I'd want it to. Right. And, and once it'll I bug you forever. Stuff, Yeah, you'll see it forever on the wall there. And then on top of that, even further is the time it would take to do it. It would take me three or four weekends to uh, have that done. Well, I had a key box on the house and I found a a gentleman who who does it and we worked out a deal. And literally I left on a Sunday and there was no uh, mudding or taping or no painting. I came back the following weekend and everything was mudded, taped, primed, all ready to go. And you know what? I had to pay for it. But the amount of money that I paid versus the amount of time, equipment and materials that I would have had to do to get that done, um, there wasn't that much of a difference. So it was definitely worth it for us to keep our project moving, to find people to do certain things like the plumbing in the house you know, setting the well tank and everything like that, I probably could have done that and figured it out. But to have somebody professionally come in and do that versus what it would cost me to do it versus them, there wasn't that big of a difference between it. So you have to kind of pick your battles. And I'd say that's the other thing that I learned in this is know what you're good at, know what you're not good at, and then find a good resource of people that can help you. And it'll help move your project along a lot faster. Yay. Yeah. And also it helps to ask you know, because a lot of times it's just a word of mouth thing to find the good contractors as well. That can be kind of tough. Yeah, we uh, we had that issue in the beginning. I mean, there was a scenarios where I had a, a gentleman come to do roofing because roofing is a really labor intensive job. And yeah. for me to find three buddies to put a roof on would have been challenging. And then it's a lot of work to do it. And for the roof, we ended up hiring somebody. Well, he came out, told us what we needed to order. I ordered all the stuff. The material showed up on a Thursday. And then he said, yep, I'll be here tomorrow morning to uh, put everything on. Friday comes around, doesn't show up. No answer, no phone. Saturday comes around, no answer, no phone. Sunday, I call the phone and it's disconnected. Monday, I call and there's, there's nothing. The problem for me was we had a big hole in the roof because we were joining the back edition onto the front edition and they yeah. weren't connected because he was going to finish that. Well, over the weekend when I was up there, we had severe thunderstorms and water was pouring into the sunroom and flooded the basement while I was sleeping in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> I have a video on that if somebody wants to see it because I recorded at like three in the morning and you could tell I was angry while I was on the thing. <laughs> Not saying who it was, but I was like, I wish that guy would have showed up. So sometimes you run into that kind of stuff with contract projects. We did. Everybody does. But, you know, for the most part, once we found a good guy to do the roof, he was the guy who actually recommended the sheetrock person. So it's kind of funny, but the good contractors tend to run with good contractors and recommend good contractors. So once you find a good one, it's always good to ask. Yay. Well, all right, cool. So I have to go uh, check on my beehives right now, actually. Um, Very cool. How are those going, by the way? Are, are, do you still have the ones in Brooklyn, too, or is it just up north now? No, I actually um, gave away the Connecticut beehives. I don't know if I've told everyone that or not. Um I just had to kind of uh, decomplicate my weekends, and um, there was a 
family member of the farm where the bees are that was is interested in beekeeping so i'm helping him learn and he's taken over the hives up there so it's kind of off my plate and i like that and then the bees down here um are much easier to take care of <laughs> so we guys are near, near a cemetery so i mean I, I i thought about that i'm like in new york where are their flowers i mean every picture I've ever seen of New York is buildings, concrete and that kind of stuff. But I guess, you know, there's parks and things like that. So there's places for them to go. Well, Brooklyn is a, a little different than, you know, the build up in Manhattan, but um, it's next to Greenwood Cemetery, if anyone wants to look that up. But the cemetery is half the size of Central Park. Wow. It's a 500 acre cemetery. So it actually divides my neighborhood from Park Slope. If any people are familiar with Brooklyn, um, Park Slope is north of the cemetery, and we are south of the cemetery. And, and it's a big divider because all the avenues stop at the cemetery, and there's only a couple that go around it, so there's always a traffic jam. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, have, having this, having the bees in the urban area is much easier than having them in the country. Uh, it's a little warmer. Uh, they're up on a roof. There's no bears, you know. And there's a ton of nectar sources here, whereas in the country, you might have hay fields, uh, but you don't have this kind of, this flora, this diversity of flora, some of it native, a lot of it not native, but you know, people have fruit trees and flowering trees in their backyards and the cemetery has so much stuff in it. So there sure. you go. One last thing before we go here, um, speaking of bears, um, did you see the video that I posted in the garden fork, uh, group with the bear on my back porch? Yeah. Yeah. Don't put your garbage there. Okay. <laughs> It, 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 we didn't. We don't store anything actually in that bench, other than you know maybe some citronella candles and that kind of stuff. But yeah, we were in the house. We're like, what is that noise? You know, and the bedroom is right there. And uh, go back to review the video, and yeah, the bear went out and was moving that chair around, and then kind of climbed up on the side and was smelling the grill. The best part about it is at the end of the video, you can see him that he moved the bench all around in different spots, and then at the very end, he moves it back basically to where it was when it started. So if I didn't have the cameras there, I would have never known that uh, ah. the bench had been moved or he was digging in or anything like that. But that's the third time we've had a bear on that deck, which is it's pretty surprising. One of them was like at three o'clock in the afternoon. He was smelling the grill. So it's uh, it's a definitely an interesting thing up in bear country. Yeah, they know their food sources. So uh, we had one once trying to get into the garage. I thought it was somebody trying to break into the cars, you know, because I kept on yep. seeing this shadow. The motion sensor light went on and there was this dark shadow moving around the cars. And uh, I thought someone was trying to steal one of the cars. So I sprung into action and uh, then I realized it was a bear. <laughs> there you go. So if you want to see that video, check out the Garden Fork group, I guess, is is my uh, pitch on that. But uh, definitely garden, fun yeah. area. So. Garden Fork discussion group on Facebook. I'll link to that in the show notes there. So we can you can find Will at the Weekend Homestead, which is basically kind of on YouTube, on Instagram, anywhere else. Uh, we have a Facebook page. We started at not having too much success on the Facebook page, but we got a lot of people on Instagram and, and YouTube. It seems like those are the two medias that everybody likes to find us on. Oh, I didn't know you had a page. I can link to that from our page. That's easy enough to do. Sure. So. All right, cool. Everyone, radio at gardenfork.tv is our email address. And um, thanks for taking the time, sir. Perfect. Thank you for having me. All right, make it a great day, everyone. Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. <laughs>